turn in your Bibles, please, to Psalm 93. Psalm 93 is a short little psalm. We do not know who wrote it. We do not know when it was written. But it is a psalm that speaks to us of the majesty and the glory of God. It is the first of eight psalms, Psalms 93 through 100, are grouped together and all of them focus on the kingship and the reigning of God Almighty. And this is the first of them. People who have looked at this psalm say that it evokes or talks about a theocracy. A theocracy is a form of government that was first coined or talked about by a guy named Josephus back in the time right after Jesus. The Romans, very interested in history and recording the history of this great nation, hired various historians, and Josephus was a Jewish person who was hired by the Roman government to write a history of the Romans at that time. And when he looked at the history of the Jewish people, when he looked at what the Jewish people were, he said that it was a theocracy, the first time that word was ever used. And a theocracy has two parts to it. It is theo, which is God, an ocracy or a rulership, a God managed government, or God is your governor, or God is your king, with no earthly king or representative. Today we have multiple forms of government. To give you an example of how this is, you have a monarchy, which is a king, which is a single person ruling the government. When you look at who has kings today, Britain comes to mind. They have a king, but it is really a queen, and it is a figurehead. You have places like China and North Korea. They have a dictator, but we could also say they're a monarchy because it is one person running the show. Whatever the person in charge of North Korea wants, they get. An oligarchy is a small group of people. We believe that Russia is an oligarchy. There are a handful of people led by Putin who run that government. And then you have a democracy, which is everybody runs the government. The government is of the people. We claim that we're a democracy, but really in America we are a republic. We elect people to go vote for us in uh, Sacramento and in Washington. And sometimes they do, and sometimes they don't. But if there is no earthly king... And if you look at Israel after Joshua, so Moses gets them out of Egypt and explains the law and explains that God is in charge of this new nation that is being created. He is the king, and then he hands it over to Joshua, and Joshua claims the promised land. But during this time, there is no earthly king, there is no earthly ruler, God worked through the high priest and the priestly system and the tabernacle system under Moses and under Joshua. And then you enter the judges, where there is no single leader throughout the 300 years of judges. But whenever the Philistines or the Midianites got too annoying, God would raise up somebody like Gideon or Deborah or Samson to wipe them out for a time until they... Israel disobeyed, and during this time, God is the king. God is the ruler, and then they, the Israelites get all hot and bothered, and they said, well, we want a king, and they got Saul, and at that point, Israel turned into a monarchy. They had a king, a single ruler, and as things progressed through First and Second Kings and First and Second Chronicles, you see that the king is not always, in fact, rarely an earthly representative of God's desires. So only for that short period of time was there a theocracy on earth. Today there is no theocracy on earth. There is a human being in charge of every country and every government on the face of the earth. Looking at the history of theocracy, 
I found that when John Kennedy, who was the first practicing hardcore Catholic running for president, people actually said, if he gets elected, he will turn America into a theocracy. They also said the same thing about George W. Bush, a very strong Christian believer. They threatened that if he became elected, which he did, both of them did, that America would turn into a theocracy, a country run by God. And of course, that never happened. And we can see today that clearly God is not running the country. And so these eight psalms talk about God's reigning, that even though I cannot point to a government on earth where God is sitting on the throne, I know that God is running the show, that God is in heaven, that God is directing things, that God is managing things. Uh, One commentator said about theocracy, theocracy is a reciprocal relationship between God and men, exalted above all these intermediary forms, monarchy, oligarchies, and democracies, which had its first manifest beginning when Jehovah became Israel's king, and which will be finally perfected by its breaking through this national self-limitation when the king of Israel becomes the king, of the whole world. And so we can look historically and say there was a theocracy once, and we can look to the future and say there's going to be one again, because when Jesus Christ returns and wipes out all earthly governments and sits on the throne in the new Jerusalem on the new earth, he will be the only authority. He will be the only king. He is God, therefore it will be a theocracy. God will rule directly the world and the human beings who are left for all eternity. And so that seems to be God's ideal, what God is working for. And so when we look at this psalm, it's only five short verses, and it starts by saying, The Lord reigns. He is robed in majesty. The Lord is robed. He has put on strength as his belt. Yes, the world is established. It shall never be moved. Your throne is established of old, and you are everlasting. And so what does this say about God and his reign? First, it talks about his majesty. And throughout Scripture, God is said to have a majesty. And when we think of that word, we may be a little unable to define it. We may be a little confused as to what majesty is. Majesty has to do with grandeur and stateliness of authority of power. And in the 21st century, if you were to pick one thing of human beings trying to put together majesty, I would have to say it was the royal weddings of the two sons of Britain, where the whole country focused on this marriage and all the government offices shut down and they walked around and just bling and all this great stuff, and you're going, wow, they've got something there. They've got majesty. They're showing or trying to show that they still matter. Back in the 80s and the 90s, you had the Soviet Union every May 1st would shut down the main drags, and they would bring their military out in a huge military parade with soldiers and tanks and missiles and At that time, they were trying to show the world, mainly us, that they had majesty, that they were somebody to be be dealt with, somebody to be feared, because they have all this military power. But whatever the earth puts together and whatever we show ourselves to say that we're great and we're majestic, nothing will equate with, nothing will equal the majesty of God. Every time God shows his majesty, people have one of a couple responses. Isaiah said, I am a sinful man, I am a man of unclean lips, and I live in a land of unclean lips, that he was aware immediately of his sin when he saw God's majesty and his glory. Peter, when he saw Jesus calm the storm, that was a showing of Jesus' majesty. He said, depart from me, I'm a sinful man. When Jesus rose from the dead 
and His majesty and glory of the resurrection occurred, all the hardened Roman soldiers fell down like dead men that we do not respond with a, hey, how you doing? When we see God's majesty, it blows us away. It blocks us in such a way that we can't conceive of it, that God's majesty is so huge and so inclusive into all of who he is that whenever we see it as natural people, as sinful people, it will always cause us to fail right before his eyes. Now, when we're glorified and when Jesus comes and the resurrection and rapture occur and people are glorified and the sin nature is removed, then we will still be able to stand, at least, in the presence of God's majesty. But I think for all of eternity, we will be in awe. We will be in wonder of how great and mighty God is. This also talks about the power of God. It says he has put on strength as his belt. The the idea that God can do things, we say he's omnipotent, that he has unlimited power, that whatever God puts his mind to, if we can say that, he will do. When we look at the uh, creation story in Genesis, and with just a word he's bringing planets and universes into existence. He's bringing living beings into existence, and he formed people with his very hands and breathed his spirit into them as a special creation. And when that creation went south and every thought of every inclination of every thought was evil all the time, God was able to cover the whole earth with water saving Noah and his family, that God's power is unfathomable. And I think people today have a real difficulty with with even accepting or understanding God's power to do anything because you can't even conceive of it. So I either accept it by faith or I begin to weaken God so that I can think about it. And these ideas of, of what God can and can't do is is really debated today, and we have to understand that God is omnipotent. He can do anything that he puts his mind to. He can do anything that he wants to, and he will. And if we spin that toward the end of time of those who stand against God, there is going to be nobody who stands against God because his all-powerful ability to beat every enemy. The third thing is it says... Yes, the words is established, it shall never be moved. And the idea of God being immovable, the theological term is immutability, that God does not change, that God is the same from eternity past, which gives us the ability to trust his word that this psalm was written 3,000 years ago. And it still speaks truth about who God is. We do not have to update it with new understanding of who God is because God is not changing. God is not growing. God is not learning. We do not surprise Him. We do not do things that He did not think about. We do not do things that catch Him off guard. The idea that God knows all things, can do all things, and is everywhere and he doesn't change, gives us a stability of our faith, gives us a stability of our understanding that we can go to church from cradle roll all the way to our last breath on this earth, and God is still the same. Now, when you think about God versus the rest of creation, everything else changes. Everything else is moving. Look at yourself. Look at pictures of yourself 10 years ago, 25 years ago. You've changed. The world has changed. Nobody could have predicted 25 years ago the fact that we have what we have today politically and technologically and with transportation and all these things. Cliff Davidson passed away at the age of 94, and if he 
When you see him up in heaven, you can ask him how many things he saw changed, and the list would be endless because 94 years on this earth is an eternity with how things change. Nothing remains the same. And so we like to say, well, God is like us, that I'm growing and I'm changing and I'm hopefully learning and I'm a different person, that clearly God is different than he was in his, shall we say, infancy. But see, God has no infancy. God is always the same. He is immutable and he does not change. It has been said that the only constant in this world is change, that if you want to bet on anything, bet that everything is going to change, and that in the next five years or ten years, people who have looked at this say that change used to be really slow. When Jesus walked everywhere, change was really slow, and when they built a stone road, the Romans did, and people were just walking on it with little sandals, those roads would last forever. But then you part putting carriages on it and horses on it and now cars on it. And you can count the number of potholes that you hit between here and home when you leave because things are constantly changing and advancing and moving. And it's difficult for some to keep up. And the last point of These two verses is, your throne is established of old, you are from everlasting, that God is eternal, that God was here long before we were, and God will be here long after this world is here, that God is eternal, he has no beginning, he has no end, he's the same all that time, and that gives us Such a sense, if you are a believer in God and in Jesus Christ, that should give you a level of peace and a level of calmness that even though the world seems chaotic and the world is falling apart and the world is full of infighting and difficulty and hate and conflict and Every time you turn around, are we going to go to war with China? Are we going to go to war with Iran? Are we going to go to war? When I was growing up, you were going to go to war with Russia and China. Now you're going to, now it's the Middle East. And so every time you turn around, there is a different thing for you to be worried about. There is a different thing for you to be concerned about. But if we are steadfast standing in the presence of God, He's not changing. He's not moving. He's got it all under control. That should give us a stability. And the the idea of God being immutable, and if I'm a believer in God, then I can truly say, when it comes to my faith, when it comes to my belief, I also will not be moved. I also cannot be moved because God does not move, and so my belief in Him does not move. If you come to verses 3 and 4, it starts talking about water. It says, the floods have lifted up. O Lord, the floods have lifted up their voices, the floods lift up their roaring. One way to look at this is go to the beach. You can go to the beach in Along the coast, you can go to Santa Cruz, you can go wherever, we're on a coast here. You can go anywhere to see the water, and it's it's chaotic, it's moving, and there's, you know, different rock formations and cracks in the rocks where the water has beaten down the sandstone in this area, and the idea that the beach itself has never stayed the same. People say that If you visited Niagara Falls 10 years ago and you visit it today, it is a different waterfall because of the erosion and the fact that you never see the same waterfall twice. The idea that the world, using water as an example, is a chaotic, always moving place. And that has zero effect on God. But some have looked at this and said, well, the floods aren't water. The floods are people, that we have a flood of humanity on this planet, and we 
to God seem like a chaotic, undulating, can't make up our minds, can't figure out what we want to do, can't know what to stand for. We come up with this form of government and that form of government. We elect this person and say, I don't like them. So we elect this person and say, I don't like them either. And then we try to do things to move it along. And whatever choice we make, it's a problem because nothing is as we expected it. And that's because if you have seven and a half billion people, they all have different expectations and no way we can get all the same page. We are like a undulating ba- uh, piece of sea of water as God will look at us. And if you try to judge God as how the world is, you will always be difficult to make the connection because God is immutable, God is unmovable, and His creation seems to be constantly moving, constantly chaotic, constantly out of control because of all the people that are involved. And so you say that every earthquake is under the hand of God. Sure, every flood, every hurricane, every tornado, but also every war, every governmental coup. Remember back the Arab Spring when uh, Egypt had a big coup, military coup, and we said, well, that will obviously turn out great. But of course, people are involved, and so they're still fighting, it seems, for the control of Egypt. Every vote, every government, every governmental leader is under God's control. Today we have a a football game, and people will gather all around to watch the Super Bowl. And many, many, many years ago, I was talking with somebody who was very involved in sports betting and bet a lot on the Super Bowl, and this person was a Christian, and I worked with him, and so we talked together, and at times we prayed together. And I said, you know, even back then, but today, God knows exactly who's going to win, but He's not telling. God knows exactly if there's going to be injuries or how long the Star Spangled Banner is or anything that is going to happen today, God knows it already and He has has, uh, caused some things to happen. Others, He has allowed freedom, but He knows exactly what is going to happen. And I told that to this person and he said, well, I, I can't accept the fact that God would be so involved in something so mundane and pointless as the Super Bowl. And I said, so what you're saying is, this is really important to you because you're putting thousands of dollars on this game. You just don't want God to be involved. You want an area of your life that can be mine. This is mine. This is my place. Nobody else can touch it. Nobody else can talk about it. And to him, it was football. To you, it may be something else. To me, it may be something different, that there is something that you you hold and you think, well, I don't pray about this. I don't really try to correlate this with Scripture. I don't put this in God's hands. And that is, a, that is human nature. That is what we do to try to become a monarchy in our own lives. Is We like being on the throne. And I'll give this thing to God, and I'll give this thing to God, and I'll give this thing to God, but I'm going to keep this. That was a booklet, the theme of a booklet back in the days called My Heart, Christ's Home, where Jesus took a tour of your heart, and the person in the book wouldn't show Jesus a closet, because that was their private thing. God is overall, God is sovereign overall. God has, God not only knows who is going to win the next election, 
According to Romans 13, God has picked the winner of the next election in every government across the world. He knows how long Putin is going to last, and he knows he has designed that, and he has picked the successor for the Russian, whatever they call their government. The idea that God is winding up humanity and sending us off and turning his back and going doing other things is ludicrous. God is actively involved. Some might say that God is micromanaging this world down to the nth degree to glorify himself and to bring it to where he wants to be. God never plays catch up. God never says, oh, I didn't know that was going to happen because he is actively involved in running the world. He is not an absent king. And so when we look at God's rule, there are two aspects in verse 5. The first is, God rules with a rule of law. You can produce a king. You can look at any country. North Korea is a good example because we don't like their king. If you upset their emperor, he will kill you. He will either have you killed or he'll blow up your house or he himself will shoot you. If he is having a bad day, people die. In America, if our government is having a bad day, people don't tend to die. They just have a bad day in Washington or Sacramento and we just let it go. But if you have a king who is directly hands-on, and they're having a bad day, then people will die, people will get hurt, people will get put in jail. And when we made America, we said we don't want that to happen, so we're going to write laws down, and we copied God in this, and we're going to say the laws that are on this paper are going to supersede and last no matter who's in office, no matter who's running in office, no matter who's doing what. We always go back to starts with the Constitution and the Bill of Rights and the Declaration of Independence and these founding documents. What God did was God wrote this book over a couple thousand years. Everything he wanted to say to us, every bit of his law that matters to us is in this book. Period. End of story. And God will never, ever, 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 ever Go against what he wrote here, add to what he wrote here, or subtract to what he wrote here. For as long as this world exists, God has chosen to limit himself to what he wrote in this book. And that is called a rule of law. So you say, well, I can't trust God, so I can't see him. You can trust God because he gave you his word. And he will always follow it as he wants us to follow it. God rules by the rule of his word. God rules by the rule of law. He's not capricious. He doesn't just do whatever feels good today like earthly kings. He has written it down a long time ago. And this is how we know God. This is how we trust God. And the second thing is God rules with a rule of justice. There's a lot of justice talk today. Justice means just or right. God's judgments are always perfectly righteous. He does not rule based on whims or, as I said before, God doesn't have bad days. God does not wake up with a headache and decide to make funky laws. God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And his judgments against people, against nations, against this earth, against uh, rebellious angels, against all those who have stood for him and against him, all of his judgments are righteous and just-based and perfect. Nobody at the end of time at the final judgment will be able to come up with a better idea than God. God is our king. Nobody can knock him off the throne. Nobody can vote him out. There is no coup. There is currently no theocracy on earth. 
But I think the Bible kind of presents the idea that if you're a believer in Jesus Christ and you're a Christian, you can have your own little private theocracy. Because the plan is, if I'm a believer in God and a believer in Jesus Christ, He is supposed to rule my life. And the rest of the world, well, I just tolerate it. Because I am in a different kingdom. I am in a kingdom where Jesus is the king. And this little tiny theocracy that you are living in will be expanded to be worldwide when Jesus Christ returns. Nobody can stop it. Nobody can change it. Nobody can make Jesus not return. He is our king, and he's coming back soon. Let us pray. Lord God Almighty, we praise you that you are coming back again, and that in coming back again, you are going to set up your kingdom. And you are going to be our king directly for all eternity. And Lord, we praise you for that. We pray that those who hear this today will understand that it is those who believe in you. It is those who believe you. Those who have faith in this event and in this person. That these things are what are necessary for entrance into this final kingdom. Lord, we praise you for that. And as your blessing on the remainder of the day, we ask all this through the blood of Christ. Amen.